talk of the year. Uh, once again, I'm honored to uh, give the first one. Be fully in person. Uh, okay. We're trying to use this as an opportunity for all of our users and Tech Talk guests to be able to connect with our lab managers and ask any questions that you don't have time for during the actual Tech Talks. Uh, so this will be in addition to our monthly Tech Talks, and it'll be once a quarter. So uh, there's more information on the website if you would like to learn more, and we hope to see you there in person. Fantastic. I'm also hoping to uh, kind of revamp how I'm doing things, uh, maybe meeting in person more. I'm going to have some office hours that people can sign up for uh, rather than writing three hour um, you know, emails. <laughs> we can actually just talk about what we need to talk about. Um, so today um, I'm going to be uh, giving a talk uh, briefly on uh, some negative staining techniques and uh, cryo TEM techniques um, and just really uh, improving your data and improving the ease in which you're collecting your data. Um, so let's begin. Um, with negative staining. Oh, and by the way, if you do have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. Oh, I see there's already three in there. Uh, or well, those three comments. All right. Um, okay. Let's close that. Okay, so beginning with negative staining. Um, so what is negative staining? So this is a, a method a lot of people use, and it's a very uh, swift method for gathering your data. Uh, basically, we're taking our protein or our... Um, molecules and depositing them on a carbon uh, uh, membrane on our grid, and then just uh, adding a heavy metal stain to the uh, the grid. And we're essentially staining the background. Um, this is a very easy technique to learn. It can be used for multiple samples um, and really a great screening method for, uh, you know, if you have samples that you want to maybe do cryo TEM with, um, but you're not really sure which ones and you don't want to spend, you know, uh, four days <laughs> screening through your samples with cryo. Negative stain is a great way to do that. Um, it can uh, stain very small molecules um, up to, you know, uh, mega molecules. Um, there was a question about um, molecules less than 200 kilodalton specifically. Um, and uh, what I'm going to recommend for that is uh, uranium formate. Um, and so I'm going to talk about those a little bit more uh, as we're going forward. So with negative staining, it's a really, uh, like I said, swift sam uh, sample prep technique. All you need are some pipettes. Uh, you need your heavy metal stain, uh, some tweezers, uh, grids with carbon membrane. Uh, you can't just use plain grids. Uh, so right there is, these are the grids I prefer to use. These are the 300 mesh uh, copper with a carbon membrane. So they come from EMS and they do a great job making these grids. Um, in addition to those, you'll want some filter paper and it's good to cut those into little wedges. Um, and then with our plasma cleaner or a glow discharger. All right, so uh, this is something I recommend to everyone. This is both for negative staining and cryo TM really, uh, but also even for ultra microtomy, you can uh, take advantage of this uh, instrument. So we have three of these in Nuance. There's one in Tech, there is one in Hogan, and there's one here in Silverman as well. Um, this is our Pelco Easy Glow Glow Discharger. And you can see in that image in the middle, um, if you don't glow discharge your grids, these carbon membranes are very hydrophobic. So when you drop cast your sample onto uh, them, they, they bead up, um, they don't spread out nice and evenly, um, and you can end up with aggregations of your, your sample and just completely empty areas of your grid. Um, so this process only takes like two minutes. You're in and out of the, the instrument. Um, it is not on Nucor, it is uh, free to use. Um, I can show you how to use it in just a few minutes. Um, it's a, a really simple machine, um, and it can really make a difference on your data. All right, so how do you negative stain? And I've, I've taught this before, um, and I can teach it to you in person, but it is a very uh, straightforward uh, routine uh, procedure that, that can be done, like I said, in like 30 minutes. Um, you begin by uh, glow discharging. Um, let's see, there's my begin by glow discharging. Uh, it's nice to have an array of, of tweezers to use uh, for your project. So if you have you know four or five, uh, that can really make things a lot easier. Um, you start by drop casting your sample onto the grid um, and then you blot it off and do a series of stains with, you know, for example, this is for urinal acetate. This is a 1% urinal acetate. Um, you don't wanna let the grid dry between the droplets. So, you know, you're, you're taking the filter paper and drawing it up on the tweezers. Again, trying not to touch the grid um, and slowly drawing all that uh, liquid away. And then as soon as you see it's almost dry, you add more. Um, you don't wanna let it dry between steps because you could end up with, um, well, more collapsing artifacts than normally uh, would be uh, seen. 
So again, this can be done in like 30 minutes. Um, and then once your grids are dry, you can get it into the microscope. So there are multiple different stains uh, that can be played around with. Now, this is both for negative staining and for cryo-TM, uh, but mostly for when we're, we're talking about negative stain here. So what we have here are some molecules uh, in the right. Um, and this sample was stained with urinal acetate. And urinal acetate is the most common negative stain, again, made with uranium. Um, the uh, Making it up, uh, you want to make it up the day before. Um, it, it saturates at 3%. Um, it's good to uh, let it sit overnight and then filter it before you use it, and then also dilute down to 1%. Um, it's best to keep that in the dark in the refrigerator. It does offer lots of contrast. Um, however, uh, urinal acetate has a pH of about 3, um, and that can absolutely you know, affect your samples. Um, so just bear that in mind when you're doing any negative staining. Um, whatever uh, metal you're using uh, may influence your samples. Um, Urinal acetate does act as somewhat of a fixative uh, for viruses and biological material. So it can kind of hold things in place a little bit, uh, but it also can precipitate out. Um, so it's possible to get uh, all sorts of uh, uranium salts on your sample uh, if you're not careful about your procedure. After that is urinal formate, as I recommended uh, earlier for much smaller molecules. This has a much finer grain than urinal acetate. Now, urinal formate is a fantastic stain. However, it's a little tricky to work with. Um, it can crash very easily um, while you're making it. Um, you can freeze it and aliquot it, but just once. Um, you don't can't reuse it after that. Uh, it has to also stay in the dark. Has to stay frozen. Um, but it's a really uh, nice and even stain, and that is one of the issues with negative staining in general, especially with urinal acetate, is uneven staining. I'll discuss that in a little bit. All right, the next stain that I uh, like to use is phosphotungstic acid. Now, PTA, um, I guess, easy to make. Um, you can titrate it up to a pH of eight, um, even though it's called an acid. <laughs> um, and it's considered more of a positive stain than a negative stain. So with negative staining, you know, we're essentially staining the background. We're leaving um, our, our this, the metals kind of pool around our molecules. Um, and we get what looks like a photographic negative, which is why it's called negative staining. Um, but in some cases, you can have more of a positive uh, stain outlook. And in this case, we have this uh, COVID virus particle here, um, and we're able to uh, see that and the, the structure involved in that with just negative stains. A malonium molybdate is another uh, really nice stain. This is much more delicate on samples that are very sensitive. Um, so I would recommend ammonium molybdate for uh, lots of things, and it's, it's good to experiment with. You can see here, this was actually a cryo-TEM experiment. Um, so on the left is, uh, in the figure A, you have, um, this is regular cryo-TEM, and then here uh, they added um, a, uh, uh, sorry, uh, ammonium molybdate. You can see clearly this is a very, very negative uh, stain appearance. Uh, you can see the background is mostly stain. Um, it's great for osmotically sensitive samples, um, uh, but it, it does it can result in a lower contrast. Uh, in this case, it's much higher contrast, but um, it can be a little challenging to work with sometimes just to get your data. Another one, I haven't worked with this one um, uh, or this one after this. So these are both available commercially from nanoprobes. So you have NanoVan and NanoW. Um, so these are, uh, again, commercially available stains. Um, they've been experimented with uh, various samples. This one here, you can see, it almost leaves the uh, the background almost like completely blank, uh, which is a nice clean appearance to things. Now, granted, that is a relatively low magnification for what we're usually working with. Um, but, you know, another uh, thing they might want to experiment with. Uh, NanoVan, I actually have heard a, a bit about. Um, again, this is a cryo-TM uh, sample here. And there's many other uh, stains uh, that might not be so common. Um, one that I have played around with um, is the lanthanum acetate, and we have that here. Um, it works very similar to urinal acetate, um, perhaps a little bit more even in its staining, um, but not quite as high a contrast. So another thing to consider um, if you're kind of running out of ideas on which stains to use, uh, maybe if um, your stains are affecting your samples. 
Okay, so let's talk about troubleshooting with negative staining. There are, as I mentioned, you can get very inconsistent results. This is on the same grid. Um, so this is collagen fibers. And you can see here, it's very positively stained. Whereas in here, we're getting more of a negative stain. Um, and you know, where do you take your data, right? So um, of course, things want to be consistent, but you have to make that, that decision. Um, here again, we have the same grid. So uh, we have, uh, you know, phage particles here. Um, and, you know, this looks very nice, but the background is stained a bit more heavily. Um, here, this is more of like, looks like a positive stain there on the nodule. And um, yeah, it's really going to depend on what you're doing. This is why I like cryo-TDM so much more. Um, it's, again, you go from sample to data in one day. Um, it takes a bit longer, but this, the results are much, much more consistent. And here we have a kind of a gradient, right? So you know, typically, if I'm imaging a, a negatively stained sample, I might see only something like this in the corner here. Um, and that's very difficult to make out any samples. Uh, whereas here, we, you know, the staining is much too dark. And then hopefully, if you're lucky, you can find a nice area like this. Um, now, this is just a little stripe here. Uh, but uh, in a lot of uh, occasions, you can have an entire grid that looks nice and evenly stained like this. Uh, but, you know, just because you don't see something doesn't mean it's not necessarily there. Um, so it could be just how your stain is reacting. Um, if your uh, sample is uneven, if your grid is uneven, if it's bent a little bit, um, the uh, urinal acetate or whatever stain you're using can pool un unevenly. And this is the number one artifact that I see with um, negative staining. And a lot of people get confused about what this might be or or uh, what you're seeing. And, you know, salts are a very common Thing to see in negative stain buffer salts. Um, so when you're seeing pointy needly things, it's probably not your sample. There's probably just a precipitation of the salts coming out. All right. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, pH can influence uh, the data and the morphology of your samples that you're looking at. Um, or at least how you're seeing them. Now, fortunately, we have a stem down the hall uh, that could image um, polymer-coated samples. We have the SE detector, so you can you know see the surface of it. And then with the dark field, the high-angle high angle angular dark field, or the TE imaging, you can light up that core. Uh, but here, this is just done with a negative stain and traditional TEM. Um, and here you can see um, with uh, you know, a very low pH uh, uh, possible tungstic acid, um, or uh, the uh, urinal acetate, uh, we can start to see the shell, which you normally wouldn't necessarily see, uh, especially without the use of any stains. Uh, so again, bear in mind how pH can influence things, uh, how different stains can influence things. And here's just a list. So I'm not going to read through these, but you know these slides are all available uh, online and uh, with the uh, on the YouTube, I believe. And so, you know, you need to reference uh, these for, it's all in one place. You've got the pHs of these various um, uh, stains. All right, so let's move on to cryo-TEM. All right, so what is cryo-TEM? Uh, I mean, I assume we're all sort of familiar with it, especially if you're here. Uh, but just to review briefly, uh, we are plunging our samples uh, into liquid ethane in a very, very thin membrane. Um, so we're pipetting, you know, maybe uh, three to five microliters of sample onto our grid, our glow discharge grid. Um, then 99% of that gets blotted off uh, by the vitrobot and before being plunged into liquid ethane. So why are we using ethane? So ethane isn't actually as cold as liquid nitrogen. In fact, ni liquid nitrogen will uh, cause liquid ethane to freeze into solid ice. Um, but liquid ethane does not have the Leidenfrost effect as you uh, see in liquid nitrogen. You know, if you pour nitrogen on your hand on accident, it, you know, it just comes right off, uh, not a big issue. If you get liquid ethane on your hand, that's going to be an injury. Uh, so that will stick and it freezes very, very rapidly, which is why we use it. Um, we keep these grids frozen and we image them uh, frozen. Here we can see on the, the right some vesicles uh, that were imaged uh, and published uh, with uh, cryo -TM. Okay, so versus negative staining, we have uh, on the left our negative stained um, particles, and on the right you can see uh, the difference with cryo-TEM. You get a much more true-to-life um, 
image here with the, the cryo TM, you can see that these particles have kind of a geometric shape to them, especially in certain spots. Uh, whereas in here, they just kind of collapse, right? And so what's happening is the uranium's pooling in these little pits and around the edges of the uh, particles. Uh, whereas here, we just have this, this very flat, very even ice, and we can see uh, the morphology much, much better. Okay, so, you know, another uh, slide that perhaps I'm not going to read all the way through, um, but, you know, the main point here is that, you know, we have this uh, relationship of, you know, the samples that that don't collapse, um, freezing is very fast, tr true life morphology uh, versus, you know, osmotic effects, uh, drying effects uh, from negative stain. Um, so there are pros and cons to each. And so something to, to bear in mind when you're planning your experiments. Cryo-TM certainly can be a challenge. Uh, you know, I've been training a few people to do it recently, um, and I'm hoping to train a lot more. Um, there's always a give and take with electron microscopy, and especially with cryo-TM. Um, you know, anytime you change one parameter to gain something, you know, you're sacrificing something else. Um, so when it comes to uh, cryo and uh, specifically, um, you know, the beam does the majority of our damage there, right? And so uh, we have to be aware of how intense our beam is versus how much data we, or how much signal we want in our data. Um, you know, we can focus the beam down, you know, and get a really intense spot and get, you know, beautiful uh, data, but maybe only for a split second, because then your ice will be uh, destroyed by the beam. So typically what I have is the beam uh, spread out very, very low. Uh, those that are using the uh, JL 1400 uh, know about uh, looking at the dose. Uh, with the camera and the one view camera. Typically, I'm keeping that below two or three. Uh, and in some cases, even, you know, less than one. Um, especially when I get up into higher magnifications. I'll talk about a few strategies to mitigate beam damage with that. Um, okay, so... Uh, one recommendation I uh, have for doing cryo TEM on the uh, 1400, we have this MDS system. Um, so with this, it is a uh, external application and it memorizes certain things about the microscope. So you can see here we have this, this is, it's off, we have search, focus and photo set. And you know these might as well just say A, B and C because they are just uh, parameters you can set up so the MDS memorizes the spot size, uh, the magnification, the spread of the beam. Um, it's supposed to keep beam shift X and Y, although we've had some issues with that recently, as well as uh, condenser lens stigmation and objective lens stigmation. Um, it does not maintain, or I should say, it doesn't change the focus between uh, the three settings though. So wherever your focus value is, wherever your, your defocus value is, it will keep that constant when you're switching between the modes search, focus, and photo set. So you may need to adjust that slightly as you uh, as you image. It also, uh, I'm gonna talk about this in the next uh, few slides here. So here we can see I have this set up um, with uh, search uh, at spot size three with 5,000 X. Uh, focus, I have it at 10,000. With spot size four, and here it's 30,000 with spot size five. But again, these can be set to anything. Now, why are we using this? The main issue, as I mentioned before, is beam damaging our ice. And if you're using the microscope and you're you're playing with brightness and you're, you're moving things around um, and you're just trying to find your sample, odds are you're gonna destroy it. Um, so the MDS system is a very nice way to just jump between magnifications without doing further alignments and ha not having to mess with the beam spread or the beam shift X and Y. Um, so, and, and here we can see uh, we're bouncing around quite a bit, which might be why we're having issues with condenser stig uh, stain a bit. We have maybe some hysteresis or something, but this is very nice because you can bounce around and take your high mag data, your low mag data, figure out where samples are much easier. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, an, an issue with the uh, stage movement. Um, the application is independent from the JOL graphical user interface, and it does not take magnification into account with regards to stage movement. It does maintain the magnification, whichever you set it, but the microscope 
for example, if in the off position, it thinks it's at 20,000 X, which is about where I would want to use it if I'm collecting my data at 10,000 or 30,000. This was frustrating to figure out because yeah, at times I would have this say at 500 X and then I would be up in say 10,000 or 30,000 and I move the stage just a tiny bit and it just whoom, goes way off to the side and I lose my area of interest. Um, so bear in mind when you're doing cryo TM uh, and you're using the MDS system, uh, make sure you keep when you have the off position, keep your magnification up high near, whoops, up high uh, near where you're going to be taking the majority of your data. Um, okay, and then a final note for cryo TEM, um, beam blank is your friend. So often when I'm imaging uh, with cryo samples, uh, I'm bouncing back and forth uh, between the beam blank and whatever I'm doing. The signal is very low. It's very hard to see what you're doing uh, with the camera even, uh, and you can't see your samples. It's hard to say if you're in focus, right? So, you know, initially maybe I'm way out of focus, maybe under focus or over focused. Uh, I can tell that at a glance, right? And so what I'm doing is bouncing around. I'm, I'm beam blanking. I'm moving the, the focus, uh, unblanking, taking a split second to look at the sample. Okay, is that better? Blanking again, moving focus. You're bouncing back and forth like that. Same thing with objective stigmation, X and Y. Um, these are things that can be fixed um, without damaging your sample too much if you're on top of the beam blank. Okay. 